welcome back everybody we do that for the recording we've all, <laughs> we've all just been chatting but for the recording all those people who are just clicking on this who are looking at this later on and i also say welcome back day two after lunch so when i'm putting them up on youtube i know what to call them yeah and we thought we would just carry on from where we left off which was people sharing observations and things like that so john you were next in line. Would you mind sharing with us what you were I'd love just to. talking about? Thanks, mate. <laughs> um, so yeah, I've, you know, so many beautiful stories about um, expressions. I'll call it, you know, expressions of the divine that that we we see in nature. And I think that you, you and Jenny, or you or Jenny mentioned yesterday, having watched a David Attenborough documentary and some amazing things. And I it jogged my memory. Um, I'm also kind of uh, I'm fascinated with this fascination that we have today in our culture with with science, right? And and scientific wisdom and knowledge at the expense of all others, right? If it's not proven to be a science, then it it doesn't exist. And we like we call it, you know, that's um, you know, it's it's instinct, right? We just well we just throw it into a big bag. We'll call it instinct, which like who knows what that is, right? Um, and you know i was watching this this um nature piece a, a while back and and there was i forget the species of fish but this whole school of fish going upstream and no they're not going upstream to spawn um but thousands of them in unison going up this specific river every year and it comes to this place where the river becomes very still and it, it opens up very wide and when the fish get there they just start swimming in this enormous circle, thousands of fish swimming in this enormous circle. And you just see it from above and it's mesmerizing. It's beautiful. It's like creating this pattern and this, this swirling as the fish go. And I, I don't know, they say for like 24, 36 hours, these fish just swim in this circle and then they leave and they all go back downstream and that's it. And they get to the end of this piece and they say, and scientists have no idea why they do it. You know, and I think about that and, you know, think of what we do as humans. We, we create music, we, we dance, we, we paint, you know, all of these other ways of expressing what we feel inside, expressing the divine. Why do we have to like, who says, well, why do humans dance? What's the scientific reason? Oh, there must be a mating ritual or something, right? Well, you know, the fish, why do they do it? Because they can, because it brings them joy, because they want to share it with us. I mean, who, who knows, right? But we just discount it and say, huh, you know, must be instinct. <laughs> so. I love that one. I love it. It's like, <clears throat> it struck me a while ago. I was speaking to a, some scientifically heavy-minded human being. And I just said, it just, just occurred to me, I said, look, all science is the study of spirit. Whether, whether we like it or not, it's all a study of the divine. You know, and that whole point of if we can't quantify it, if we can't measure it, if we can't understand it, then we'll just ignore it. Right. You know, and the problem with the material materialist science is it leaves us open to what's called mysteries you know and these mysteries become these things that are oh they're freaky they're weird uh, but they're not the nature the natural you know and as long as we are in this materialist paradigm we're missing the greatest trick we're missing the most important part like i said yesterday over a hundred years ago, the double slit experiment was undertaken in Sweden and it was discovered that consciousness directly, directly creates the collapsing of like subatomic particles. And that's what's the building block of what we call the physical world. Right. Our consciousness directly affects the material world. It is creating it. We don't see, you don't see it. We don't bear witness to it with the eyes, but our consciousness is literally creating the world. And the reason why um, Einstein fell out with Bohr, was it Bohr? Bohm. Bohm. 
one of them, I can't remember, whoever, whoever was doing the double slit experiment was, because when he explained what he discovered to Einstein, that consciousness is literally collapsing the universe into a, into a physical manifestation, including the body. He said, Einstein said, so you're telling me that the moon doesn't exist unless I perceive it into objective reality. And he said, yes, that's how, it, that's how it's looking, yeah. Einstein said, well, I prefer to believe the moon exists even if I'm not looking at it. So that's where Einstein kind of dropped off the quantum part. That's where he kind of, his limitation came. And subsequently, experiments have been carried out. Not, you, don't, you don't get to hear about this in mainstream. You actually have to go looking for it. And scientists are going, if it was born, they say whoever it was who was having this conversation with Einstein, and they were saying, no, he was more accurate. That this whole world that we see is, is a collapsing via consciousness via this energy that we all are which i suppose is the same thing that the the mystics and the buddhists and the hindus found when they were saying if you want to change this world change yourself and the world changes right you know it's like mysticism when, with quantum it's like mysticism and science suddenly become entangled which is the state of being call it quantum entanglement you know you, mm -hmm. everything affects everything we were just speaking to a man just before I just went to a shop. And we had a bit of a, we've had this conversation with a few people lately who don't really like what's happening in this world at the moment. They don't like the narrative that's being spread. They don't feel comfortable with it. And there are people in this world who feel totally comfortable with the narrative that's being spread. There's some people who are absolutely terrified of the narrative that's being spread all these different realities taking place. That's why I can't cast judgment on anybody else because it's my reality. It's the way I perceive this world and the way I choose to live my life. And I have to have acceptance that other people see their life in a different way. I have to have that acceptance. If I don't, I, I go to war. And this man was saying, I'm livid. I said, I get that. I've been there. I've been terrified with what I've looked into outside of mainstream news. It got me really down. I felt really uncomfortable. But there was this part of me that knew that this uncomfortableness was not useful. Part of it wasn't actually necessary. It's part of me that was quite aware of that, but I didn't mean I didn't go into this depression for a few weeks. And it was quite interesting because we were speaking to this man and he was saying, how do you change people with so much money, with such power? Mm. And I said, you can't. There is something that is bigger than one man, one group of men or women, one population, that is more powerful. It's more powerful than an entire world economy. It's more powerful than atom bombs. It's more powerful than the entire nuclear arsenal of this planet. It's more powerful than the entire arsenal of whatever weaponry is in the universe. And that's consciousness. That's what you were going to call this event, wasn't it? The consciousness, the ultimate democracy. I was going to call it consciousness, the ultimate democracy. In a time when democracy is questionable does it even exist i was going to call it consciousness the ultimate democracy because consciousness doesn't it doesn't lie it doesn't take it doesn't take political sides its bias is love and i said to this man the only way you can change those people is if you change yourself It's the only way you must if you really want to see a fairer world where money is more evenly distributed you must become fairer yourself you must change yourself because and he said oh so i suppose it's like each person's an island 
I said, yeah, you could say that, but each island only exists because of the ocean. Take away the ocean, there is no islands. And whatever rubbish we put into the ocean, the ocean and the rest of all the islands get to pick up all that rubbish. If we decide to chuck rubbish into the ocean, all, it's going to pollute the rest of the islands. They will have rubbish washing up on their shore. But if we clean up our island, if we stop putting rubbish into the into the ocean, the rest of the islands stand the opportunity of cleaning up. Less rubbish is going to wash up onto their island. They'll live in a cleaner, a cleaner island. And it, it, it's like you were saying, John, it's like it's such an ethereal concept, this connection. We're all connected because we live in this world of the senses. And it's almost as though where I can feel up to is where I stop. I can feel to the end of my fingertips. I can feel to the end of my toes. Therefore, I must end where the body ends. What appears to be a body ends. But we don't. And that is so, such a, it's been such a bastardized concept. It's been poo-pooed. It's been turned into the realms of the woo-woo and all this stuff. And uh, I'm a realist. I live in the real world. Do you? You live in the real world. Whose real world? Whose real world do you live in to say that there is a real world? Whose real world? The 7.7 .7 billion different real worlds just in humanity. Who's real world? No, we live in the world of our experience and our reality and our dream. But this dream, going back to the quantum and what it appears to look like in the quantum theory, this dream has the capacity to affect. We're each responsible for the way the world is right now. All of us are responsible for the way the world is right now. There is not just a group of people with lots of money that are in apparently or unapparently, whichever way you want to look at it, or possibly affecting the world. It's every single one of us with our decisions and the way we choose to live our lives. What we decide to put into the ocean. And this man was putting fear in. terrified you can't neutralize acid with acid you must put its opposite in if you want to neutralize an acid so i on bee stings you rub acid and on wasp stings you rub alkali i think that's the right way around yeah check it before you yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah we'll check that one yeah before, before you do Dave's it advice. yeah before you do it you know, with anaphylactic shot <laughs> <laughs> but it seems so justified that in a world of negativity and fear at the moment to be afraid and somehow this being afraid it appears like it's keeping us safe because i'm a realist this world is illusory it doesn't exist like what we appears to exist as the consciousness of humanity changes the world changes people change there's a study on japanese islands it's called the hundredth monkey effect many people have probably heard this where the macaque monkeys of the archipelagos of japan and on the mainland of japan they they love sweet potatoes and for years scientists have been giving them sweet potatoes taking them out and throwing them in the sand the monkeys love the sweet potatoes but they hate the sand so they're always brushing the sand off before they eat them and a few years ago scientists saw one of the young monkeys on one of the islands take their monkey down to the water they take their sweet potato sorry down to the water and they washed it and another one saw it doing it so it went down and it started washing so two monkeys on the same day started washing their sweet potatoes Within a week or so, some of the adults started to wash their sweet potatoes. And before they knew it, they'd reached a critical mass in this behaviour. 
And all of a sudden, what they noticed was all across the archipelago and onto the mainland of Japan, where they are not connected um, via sight or they're too far away to shout, monkeys started to wash their sweet potatoes en masse. They all became aware in a very short period of time. So the scientists that were studying that, they, they did an experiment on human beings and they took this painting and it was a face and in this face was a hundred faces. And this was done in Australia. So they, they, showed, they showed countless people through how many faces, like groups of people, look at this picture, how many faces do you see? And they said they were coming out with like seven, eight, nine faces out of a hundred. They could see seven, eight, nine faces out of a hundred in, in this face within faces within faces within faces. Then they flew this picture to England and they broadcast it on some little crappy BBC programme. And they pointed out every single face. It's here, 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 here. So everybody who watched this programme knew where all the faces were and they, because they had them pointed out, they could see it. Then they rung up Australia and said, we've done the experiment. What they said was there was a significant jump instantly in how many, and a, a quantifiable kind of sustained jump in the amount of faces that were seen from that moment on, just because a small group of people on the other side of the planet had seen it. It affected the whole. This isn't measurable in terms of with any form of apparatus other than counting and doing experiments and counting. But the evidence is there that the more, what with the state of mind that we live in does affect the world. It does affect the people around us. Which is why quite often Sydney Banks would say, would say, you know, to paraphrase effectively, if you change yourself, you'll change your family. Because the resonance that you live in, given that everything is a vibration of energy, the resonance that you live in affects. I remember Keith Blevin saying, <laughs> Keith Blevin saying about how this is where the across the pond uh, language kind of needs to be needs to be um, researched. Yeah. He said, you know, if you go into a guitar shop and you pluck the G string, and of course, all the British people think that's brilliant. Let's go plucking some G strings. He said, every G string in the, in the guitar shop, so long as it's tuned to G, will vibrate. The resonance goes round all the guitars. The resonance, the vibration. And this is why getting angry about if you believe there is some agenda going on in the world at the moment, if that's what appears to you, this is why getting angry about it is never going to solve it. It's going to feed it. This is why that's like pouring acid on acid. This is why the teachers who have woken up and they've wanted to create a more beautiful world they've said you must love you must find love you must start with yourself you must find peace in yourself and then peace will go out into the world like the monkey washing its sweet potato this is something i've had to discuss with a dear friend of ours because they were so hostile and showing us all this stuff all this evidence contrary to what we're being told on the news and it's up to us, us whether we take that or leave it believe it or disbelieve it but i just said to this person you getting angry and fighting and not sleeping at night and having your blood pressure at 190 does not does not help the world it does not help the cause which you're trying to you're trying to um, help there is big, this conversation that Sid brought to the world was something so big 
the conversation Jesus Christ brought to the world was something so big, the conversation Buddha brought, Gandhi, Mother Teresa. You know, they brought, they brought action with peace and love. They knew the greatest action, the greatest rebellion against any form of tyranny, if somebody is living in tyranny, is action from love. Fighting causes more, fighting causes suffering. It's not saying don't do anything. It's certainly not saying do anything. It's being, it's saying be cautious what you put into this world. If you want to see a different world, you must become different yourself. It changes the world you see and you live from that space. And it helps other people find peace. Because even the most tyrannous human being is ultimately still just trying to find peace. They're not bad people. Evil doesn't actually exist in this world. Insecurity exists. Fear. That's what people call evil. There is no evil people. Everything's made of love. There's fear and there's the idea that we don't have enough or we need to control. It's all born of fear. The scared people. Perhaps we're trying to keep up with the Joneses. Perhaps we're trying to keep up with those in the golf course and those in the wherever. It's all fear. It's not evil. And I think the more we can step away from the idea that there is such a thing as evil people, we will meet people in love. And when we meet people in love, then we can really start to change this world. It sounds hippie and it sounds completely contrary to the hard man that I used to be that used to think that fighting people was the safest place to be if I was harder than you and I can intimidate you I'm safe Maki I know you and I have lived that life got us nowhere but in pain but it was a beautiful conversation I love what you're saying there John you know why can't life just play why? when we watch the um, the lambs at the moment yeah it's like little lamb gangs and they go around and then sometimes it looks like they're all bullying another lamb like they're just playing and jumping off things and having fun and it's like you watch them and it's like watching children play they're alive yeah i'm here now wow this is mad i'm gonna play in this reality in this beingness and some of them play. are like a bit kind of will come up to you and other ones are like terrified the moment yeah. they see you and Love that, John. It made me think we, um, the first time I ever saw a murmuration was probably five years ago when I first came up to the Lake District. Starlings, and yeah. We um, were driving back from Scotland, I think, and we, it was at Gretna. And I was like, stop, what's that? And you were like, oh, it's a murmuration. So Dave pulled over and I was just almost in tears. And we watched for about an hour as the starlings were murmurating. And it's, it is like all of these tiny little beings like moving as one and creating these shapes and and it's mesmerizing to watch and like scientists do come come up try and come up with ideas of why they do it and we we do i think there is quite a few ideas but it was almost like well who cares why like wow yeah it was so i'll never forget that moment and again we had my niece up when she was struggling a bit and she was quite down and not very responsive and again we were driving and i was like let's see if the murmuration's there and it's like the moment she we stopped the car and she got out she was in amazement she wasn't thinking about herself or the fact that she wasn't feeling so good she was just in like total awe of this natural wonder that we can't explain and we don't need to so we'd love to hear more from people so thanks john Sylvie, did you unmute yourself? I did, yes. Um, a couple of times throughout the day, I keep coming back to uh, a bee, a bumblebee. I don't know why there was uh, a woman said about a blind fish in a pond that was unaware, therefore it was unafraid. Um, and the, the surfer on it was being sort of stalked by the shark, but I mean, that one, that threw up a few different things. Is Maybe the shark just wasn't hungry. So that's, 
<laughs> that's the universe being looking after one and the whole, you know. So, um, but I mean, I, I don't know if you saw, I was sketching a bee, and it's, um, I don't know if you can see that, just, just sketching, and, and it's, I heard a story, I don't know where I heard it, I can't tell you who it was, but it's according to the laws of physics. A bumblebee shouldn't fly, or it can't fly, because its wings are too small for the body. But nobody's told the bee, and it's so it flies. It's, and I think it's you can apply it to so many different things, but it's more specifically for people who are possibly feeling low or or that they've been told they can't do something. It's well. You're only not doing it because you've been told you can't do it. Do you know? So I mean, it's probably a better way of putting it, but it's, it keeps coming back. And then you said about the beast things, and I was like, I've got to get this in somehow. Um, but yeah, it's just the beautiful thought is that nobody's told this bee that it, it can't do what it does, so it just does it. Do you know? And it's. That's all, really. That was that's all I wanted to say. So. Oh, thank you. Love you said it. it beautifully, by the way. You do. You do. <laughs> Absolutely, man. I'm tempted to put it back on mute because the, the dogs have started barking at the neighbours. So. <laughs> uh, uh, it's because I'm talking to somebody else who gets all jealous. Bless him. <laughs> no, that's it. The limitations in mind. I suppose as well it's to do with what well, you're talking about science and if you can't quantify something then you know it becomes a rule but I mean that there is I think helicopters as well they're the same aren't they they're not supposed to fly right but they do so we just just accept it okay yeah it's yeah. it's our theories that need addressing yeah yeah it's, it's yeah. the way, it's what we think. It's our limitations that we've placed upon reality. There is no limitation on reality, really. We just, well, I remember when I woke up, it was like, I don't know if I was told, I can't really explain it. It was just, there are gifts within consciousness and thought that humanity isn't awake enough yet to utilise. You know, future generations, and maybe even our generation, at some point, maybe even in our lifetime, we will see people displaying things that we would look back and we'll go, do you know what, back in our day, that wasn't possible. We thought that was impossible. We lived in this paradigm of limitation. But the thing is about consciousness is the world is getting better. The world's getting better. People are waking up. People are, look at the people engaging in this conversation. There's people from every walk of life, from all over different parts of the world. There's people from all walks of life. And it's like, we're, there's, this is just the principles. There are other methods of awakening people. There are other conversations that help people wake up as well. You know, some people wake up with religion. Some people just wake up looking at a flower. Some people wake up through deep trauma. Some people wake up going to a psychologist. Hypnosis. You know, some people take hallucinogenics and have life-changing experiences. This is just one conversation. And so we have this situation where the world has kind of got to the point where it's going, there's more to life, and I know there is, I'm going to go in search of it. Many people are now embarking on this. Remember the hundredth monkey thing? The more people start to question and start to wake up, it affects the whole. It raises all the other people along with it. Was it, uh, who was it says all ships rise with the tide? George used to quote George it. Frank, Frank, Pansky, was it? All ships rise with the tide. It's a beautiful thing. And it is, it's that as, as, our, as, as the tide rises within humanity, new possibilities emerge. And we'll look back and we'll go, there was a time we thought the bee shouldn't fly. And uh, the kids will go, what? 
What do you mean? No. Like the kids who can't believe that life used to exist before Google. It's yeah. like, what do you mean? And it will all be because the consciousness of humanity is risen. It won't make sense to them anymore. This is why, you know, people say there's too many people on the planet. There isn't. There isn't too many people. There's exactly the right amount of people there should be on the planet because they're all here. The problem comes because of the way consciousness is on the planet. It's 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 based around a system that isn't balanced. And a, and a culture that, you know, perhaps eats in a way that isn't sustainable. But there's enough space on this planet. There's enough resources on the planet. What needs to change is not not would reduce the world's population it's to it's to start to be different all of us just need to raise our level of consciousness and start to be more be more aware and we'll make different choices and we'll learn to look after each other and love one another it's totally possible but it won't be found in fear you watched a great um documentary by bruce parry called Tawai and there's just a the whole thing's worth watching if you can if you I think you have to sort of get it streaming on uh, the Tawai.com website but it was a moment where he was out in Malaysia and seeing how people that had lived in a nomadic way were now having to try and live in um, buildings that kind of aid workers had built for them to prove that they lived there because their habitat was being destroyed and it was a community he'd visited years before when he did, did the BBC series. But he just had this moment where he just stood there and he said, it's so easy to blame big business and to blame corporation. He said, but it's me and it's my neighbor and our new iPhone and our new this. And you saw him kind of just stand there for a moment and really just realize his, his part to play in it all rather than blaming outside. and. We both kind of walked out of that and it, it did. Oh, oh he's gone. <laughs> Rusty just fell off his chair. It's not very high. Uh, is he all right? I don't know where he's gone. He's, a, he's all right. He's all right. <laughs> um. <laughs> I love this conversation. I. I um, grew up going to temple, and um, in and there's a holiday once a year, the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur, um, and it's a it's a chance to look back and and look at what what I've done, but also the world. So there's a <laughs> sorry, <laughs> there's a there's clearly a squirrel out there. <laughs> <laughs> He's like, what are you guys talking about? There's a squirrel. Just forget it. Um, more importantly. <laughs> more importantly. <laughs> forget what I was saying. Um, but there's a prayer and um, and you, you basically, it's a way of saying like asking for forgiveness, but you ask for forgiveness for everything that's been done and you own it. So for the whole world, like, please forgive me for for killing my sister or my brother, please forgive me. And and there's a way that you you own everything that's happening as one yeah. that always really struck me. But what I love about that holiday most is um I didn't learn this till I was a bit older, but you wear white, you're supposed to wear white, not black, to temple on that day because it's a celebration. It's a celebration. It's not a it's not like a it's not a it's a celebration of the fact that we can make mistakes and we can see them and we can take care of them and it's an opportunity to do that it's just a beautiful honoring of being human i think um and but when you were talking about you know the whole world like there's a way that it's just you know if if something happens around the world like that's me too you know and um, I was thinking about, you were talking about like the limitations of the body and there's been all these references to animals. And like, I was listening to what you said about 
if you look at anything, what does it teach you, you know, long enough? So on the break, Franklin loves to sit at this window and he'll just sit and stare outside forever, you know, and he watches everything. So I went and I put my face to his and I felt every little movement, like, cause it just looks like he's staring, but he doesn't, he's catching every little thing. And I, and I wanted to see what he was seeing, you know? <laughs> And it reminded me of my beagle. Um, I had a beagle and when we'd go for a walk, I'd be like seeing the streets and the beautiful houses and the water up ahead, but he'd have his nose to the ground and his walk had nothing to do with anything that I was seeing. Like he could tell me where every bunny rabbit was in the neighborhood, you know? It's like, there was a bunny there and there were two there and this is how they lived. And, you know, his whole story was so different. He was living in a different world. And I, and I realized like, what if, so, so the world's coming to me through my senses. That's one way the world's coming, right? But what if my eyes were like electron microscopes, you know? I wouldn't even be able to see the start of another body and the end of another body or the start of another tree and the end of another tree, right? It would all be that one essence. I mean, I'm not exactly sure how electron microscopes work, <laughs> but, I, but in my mind, it was like, you know, the edge of the skin doesn't, doesn't show up in that, you know? It just, but, so anyway, these were just some of my reflections from today um, and yesterday. It's been, it's been really beautiful listening to you. Thank you. That was lovely, that. Sean Franklin. Oh, and <laughs> see, this is what he does. Oh, go back to doing what you were doing. Well, <laughs> <laughs> he's like, no, now I'm on screen. Yeah. He's <laughs> lovely. Not a big lad. He just, he <laughs> just sits and he's a big lad. He just sits and, and he just looks like he's just meditating all day. I love, I love animals. <laughs> yeah. They can teach us an awful lot. You often say Rusty's taught you a lot. Yeah. Patience, forgiveness. Respect as well. Mm -hmm. I think just just because he is so tiny and you can pick him up doesn't mean he always wants to be picked up and no. starting to let him have a have a bit more say. Uh, Mackie, did you have your hand up for a while? And now you've taken it down. Thanks, Sharon. Look I noticed, so. Yeah, sorry, I was going to whip out of it there. Um, so what I've noticed is I kept my camera off most of yesterday and this morning because there was a Jackal and Hyde kind of thing going on. Um, and luckily I messaged Jen and Dave just before the lunch break there, seeing how I felt like I was on a bit of a tightrope of my mood, my temper, um, and my beliefs of all of this new learning that I'm getting into. And um, something happened on, on Friday, which really like, I'm not going to go into details, it's personal, but really kind of would be pissed because I, I felt like I hadn't done anything wrong and I was getting something, yeah. So, and I went on to kind of a bit of a self-destruct of being pissed off and my ego really coming in and wanting to like, um, wanting to like say me peace. But then I want to give the person, like the other person involved, like give them a break about it. Because after speaking to Dave, I can totally see that people are just people are just doing what's natural and that's looking after yourself. And what I'd done for the last two years was um, try to join in this this amazing event that Jen and Dave put on. Um, but I couldn't really hear because I, I I, I told Jen and Dave I felt like I was on a tightrope as in one slip one way or the other and it was the ego was really like being loud and present and full of judgment and full of being pissed off uh, and then on the other side I would see that it was going to be a temporary um, a temporary shift in in me mood and in me understanding of it all um, and I kind of found it really hard to hear the, the messages that have been going on. Everything's been beautiful that people are seeing. I love what Sylvie was saying about the bee because I, f I knew I wanted to listen to everyone in the last two days. But my ego was saying, don't listen. Don't listen to them. It doesn't mean anything. It's just people's 
namby pamby stories. It means nout. It means nothing to you right now. So I was that voice. I'd told myself not to listen. But then me, me real true self that I've found when I kind of awoke, thanks to Jen and Dave and thanks to Claire, who's on somewhere, getting us on that retreat back in November, was telling us to be kind, give yourself a break and listen and join in. And Jen and Dave, um, out of their amazing love and spirit, um, called us up during the lunch break and we had, we had a nice chat. There was a few swear words going on from me. I think Dave might have kind of, in a um, simple way, told us to, like, get on with it. Uh, put your camera on. And then I think Jen said, yeah, and we'll pick on you to talk when we've got nothing else to say. And I thought, you know, what am I doing again? Every time I'm on these retreats, people are going to think I'm just a whinge and bastard and I'm miserable and you know what I'm not I've got a I've got a big smile on my face um I try to smile like majority of the time and what I'm finding really difficult about the this understanding of the three principles is I'm still taking external influences so personally so personally but I do know even when I do take it personally that it is going to shift it's not going to stay with us for minutes or hours or days or weeks. It can shift in a split second. And, um, yeah, so I just want to say thank you and for giving me, and, like, to Jen and Dave for giving us the opportunity to, to smile um, and to really kind of see, uh, to see, to see the real real essence in life it's, it's quite difficult when you're feeling low you become or I become so wrapped up and like a blinkered horse I can see that one tunnel vision um, but I know things are different from pre-October because I would never have stuck to sitting for yesterday for like seven hours or whatever uncomfortable I wouldn't have sat this morning to be uncomfortable I would have switched off to it in seconds and I would have went out and done my own thing and then probably regretted it so I don't know if much of that made sense but yeah the, the tightrope has suddenly got a lot wider and I feel like I'm on a steady path I'll right. leave it at that thank you I love that mate I love the way you've changed your story from lunchtime as well because what Paul actually said to us was he said I haven't put my camera on because I haven't done my makeup and I haven't been there. <laughs> <laughs> nah. This pretty face doesn't need no makeup, Dave. <laughs> oh, yeah. There's a lot of face on that head, isn't there? There's a lot of face. Um, no, man. That's it, you know. Sharon, how quickly can you lay your fingers on your poem? Forgetting. Um, I got it. Right. Can you read it? Yeah. I feel like that. You no, know, this poem oh. still helps me. <laughs> I think this speaks to it beautifully. Um, you want the introduction too? Or the poem? Okay. That's sweet to ask, thank you. I've been pondering the theme of forgetting and remembering this past month and the judgment we can fall into around it. Forgetting and remembering happen over and over. Short-sightedness and discouragement dissolve in a moment into understanding and loving perspective. Only to inevitably fall back again into short-sightedness and back again. Is there an operating glitch in humanity that this should happen? Did something go wrong with our creation? Should we indeed feel badly about our forgetting, our low moods, or our top temporary loss of perspective? Are we truly broken that we sometimes grumble at those we love most only to apologize later? 
My dear teacher, Sydney Banks, would say that the moment of waking up, the moment of insight, is a moment of touching pure consciousness, a moment of touching the infinite. For who can say where that waking up comes from and the expansive information it can bring? Who can claim credit for the exhilarating or enlightening ahas? To me, that's a fascinating and enlivening inquiry. Waking up would be a lost gift if we never fell asleep. I'm so grateful to have learned that the, wake, the moment of waking up for me, the moment of wonder and gratitude when seeing comes, feels even more sacred <clears throat> than the joy, understanding, or peace that follows. The moment of insight to me is a moment shared with the infinite. It's an expansion of spirit. And despite the fact that I can't press that moment to my heart and keep it, and I seem to always remain just as human after, the moment does something. It takes on a life, it touches and it grows. I wrote this piece in honor of what I see as the beauty that would not exist without the forgetting. In short, the beauty of being born to this wild existence, being caught up by what our senses and our feelings so emphatically convince us is real, and then remembering. Thank you, forgetting. I love and honor you. And it's called an ode to the forgetting the hardest thing. The hardest thing is the forgetting. It's as natural as the serrated lava rock that cut my soul in Maui. As infectious as the barnacles on the steep ocean rock as I climb for a view. As inevitable as birth and death and as the heart song and heartbreak they wreak. The forgetting is every day truer than sunrise and more dependable than sunset. The forgetting is my eyes telling me they see, my hands telling me they hold, my ears telling me they hear. It's the breeze on my skin telling me that my skin is my own, telling me that I'm my body and my senses. The hardest thing is also the softest, a bed of thistle that dissolves in the light of day into a blanket of moss, a cacophony of sound that in a moment sings a knowing a nightmare that infuses gratitude into the moment of waking. The hardest thing and the softest thing is to know that any of life's insecure, affection-starved subjects, shame, worthiness, loneliness, are all born from nothingness, carry on only from breathing life into them, and still sucker punch with a laugh, because that's the funhouse of mirrors and tricks that fascinates, delights, or terrifies, that simply being born and living. The hardest and softest thing is the teasing torrent of thought that looks like having and losing, success and failure, that tastes like shame and touches like ecstasy, and one and all, eventually, always, in a moment of presence, dissolves into quiet, into peace. The forgetting is what we were born to do. The hardest thing is remembering that. Yeah, I think that was better than what I was going to say. And I think that speaks beautifully to it, Paul. Sharon's poem. It's that we're not always going to live in that space. We must, we must find acceptance for that. Otherwise, we'll just be at war with ourselves. We've just created another belief that I should always be there. I should always be there. I should always be in that space of witnessing. A man once said to me when I asked him, what do you think you're looking for? He said, I will, if, I, if I understand the principles, I will at all times be in constant union with God. And we're like, you already are. You already are. 
Will you always see it? No. But that's the play of life. It's a game of life. We're here to experience. Thank you for reading that out, Sharon. Yeah, it's beautiful. Like the first time I heard Sharon read it was you taught a yoga class in Santa Inez, uh, the retreat we ran with Amy Chen Mills. And at the end, I came up to you, I was like, please share that poem with me. Who wrote it? And you're like, oh, it was me. <laughs> I've read it so many times and, and asked, like, is it okay to share? So it's sort of been up on Facebook because it's, every mm. time I hear it, it's just a, such a beautiful piece of writing. And then also the lead up to it. I heard you read that at the retreat that Rudy and Dickon did together. And I thought that was a poem. Yeah. But I was thinking this is a different yeah. poem. Oh, oh, this is this wasn't the poem I was thinking of, but it was no. <laughs> <laughs> Beautiful. Mm. Beautiful love. But it's that going easy on ourselves when we're not going easy on ourselves when we're not seeing it and going easy on our, on other people when they're not. Jesus Christ himself went into the money lenders and threw all their shit everywhere. Lost his rag. Sid Banks was man who was, we, we got to have a meal with David Banks, didn't we? Around our friend Terry and Brian's house. David Banks was Sidney Banks' son. I remember him sitting down and he just said to me, he said, he said to the table, he said, if I had to tell you about the most compassionate human being I've ever met in my life, a real privilege, somebody with great wisdom, patience and kindness, he said, I'd have to talk to you about my mum. He said, if I was to talk to you about somebody who was quick to temper, but very spontaneous in the moment, I'd have to talk to you about my dad. He wasn't afraid to experience. He wasn't afraid to feel. He didn't see a problem. With, he didn't see something wrong with feelings. He knew that he was perfect no matter what state he was in. He saw the perfection of all existence. He hadn't categorised it and split it up. Or perhaps he had in his previous incarnation before he woke up. But after he woke up, he didn't split experience into good, bad, right and wrong. It was all just experience. It's all experience. It's all a play. It's all mind. The beautiful thing is when an individual stops fearing experience, they experience the feelings that they feared less. It's just the way it is. Because we're not afraid of being afraid, so therefore we're not a dog chasing its tail. Dave, can you say that again? Probably not. What was it? <laughs> About the experience. It's just a 15 second rewind. Oh, one second. Um... Of you. think it was something along the lines of seeing all experience is the same thing. Sid didn't. Sid, Sid saw all experience was one thing. It's all a play. It's all a play of mind. There was no separation once he woke up to good, bad, right, wrong. It's all one. And there is something in seeing that when we can unify experience rather than splitting it, our mind, our ego wants to split and compartmentalize and understand things, separate. The ego separates. The ego is a separation in itself. It's an illusory separation, but it's, a, it's the experience of a separation. And the ego then goes on to separate and separate and separate and separate. But when we unify all experience and understand, a fact, in fact, should I do the lake? Um, we'll do it tomorrow. Okay. Yeah. Because, yeah. We'll see it. Mean, because it, it'd be nice to hear from people. Yeah, it would. We'll do that tomorrow. If anyone else has questions or comments, please. But it, it's that unifying all experience back together as one. Not saying that good is bad and right and wrong is the same thing. They're all perspectives. But understanding that where they are born is all the same thing. 
like every single wave on an ocean looks different different size different uh, crest and trough depths different velocities you've got big waves on an ocean you've got tiny waves on an ocean you've got tiny waves upon the waves but it's understanding that no matter what the ocean is doing whether it is in a ferocious storm and throwing rocks up onto roads and washing away railway tracks and smashing houses off dropping cliffs down and houses dropping in because it's been such a violent sea to go back to it the next day it's still the sea when it's calm still all water it's like experience experience of stormy emotion is is born of exactly the same place as peace without judgment it's the same thing it's only in judgment which in itself is always going to be a duality it's always going to be a separating it off saying oh this is different that it creates the idea of right wrong good bad broken damaged ill these are all thoughts not things, not objective truths. Paul, do you have, I wasn't sure if you put your hand up again or whether it was still up. But Yeah, sorry, I'm not going to shut up now. Uh, no, it's just, re, just a real quick one. Um, you mentioned earlier about, uh, or you mentioned a few times on the community groups and on the retreats about you, a problem can't be fixed um, coming from the same energy, and then you mentioned it's never really that that light bulb's never really been flicked on for me uh, because I've had such an angry, I think, life. So yeah, if something angry happened to me, my anger would equal it or match it, and I would get through it. <clears throat> and you mentioned today about um, I think you brought in the, the bee sting and about putting acid, to neutralise acid, you put the opposite, you put like an alkali on. And it's just like, I don't know if I'm going to sound really stupid here, uh, but to me, it's, it's such a big lesson that I've just learned there. So because I felt like I was wronged over the weekend and I've just kept myself in this little like angry cauldron, mixing it all, <laughs> like really stirring it. And... As soon as I spoke to you guys at lunchtime and kind of cut myself a bit of slack and gave myself a little bit of love, it's all disappeared, as I said, to lead back to this irritatingly um, big smiley face on the screen. And God, it's like shit, it's so obvious. I've just stirred that mixing pot and added a few shitty ingredients throughout the weekend to keep myself there and as soon as I've just let go because at the end of the day nothing's happened I haven't I haven't I haven't been out murdering people anymore I haven't I haven't I haven't been out I haven't been out using drugs I haven't been out stealing I haven't hurt anyone I, something's just happened that's kind of pushed my button and pushed someone else's and it's 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 led to me like it's led to my ego taking like a bit of a beating and I've just kind of twigged that there's a big part of my ego that's very useful and it gets us through my workman days and it gets us through things where you've got to function physically. But there's a big part of my ego that's a bit of an arsehole. And um, maybe if I'd cut myself a bit of slack yesterday, I would have got that light bulb moment of anger isn't going to fix me being angry. The only thing that is, is what you guys have done at lunchtime, showing us a bit of love and a bit of understanding and me going, oh, actually, yeah, you're right, you're right. And, um, and yeah, so my ego has um, disappeared. He's run off to his little cave. Um, so, yeah, using the opposite does work, truly. Soft lad. People are going to think that we um, 
we get you to tell these stories because each retreat you have something to share that then it, like we get messages about how helpful it's been or and like last time you had such a bad day and like I just wanted to tell everyone to piss off with their love and then suddenly you kind of just came out of it and you and Dave's like how are you feeling right now and you're like yeah I'm pretty good now but it's yeah. like you see in real time like how easy it is to get caught up and how yeah. suddenly you remember and I think that's what the poem speaks so beautifully to just the naturalness of it and you see you see that reality is a temporary momentary experiential event it's a temporary momentary experience that's what everybody's reality is it's always the the, the fact of reality isn't temporary it's permanent experience is permanent it never goes anywhere but the flavor in which it takes is always a temporary thing the thing is I remember we went for a walk and we'd had a big storm and then you looked at this morning and you're like, fucking hell, this is in for the next year. It was like, it was howling it down, thunder, lightning. You could not, it was pitch black in the middle of the day. And then we walked out in the afternoon, the evening, and it, there wasn't a cloud in the sky. You're like, where's that gone? How can that storm, I mean, it must have been miles high. It was, it was ridiculously violent. How, how can that have just vanished out of the sky? But it had, and we were walking around and you were saying, you know, that is like our lives, isn't it? We live in these storms. These storms come along in our lives and they throw us around and we feel bashed and we feel drenched and cold and out in the cold by it all and zapped by lightning and we feel hammered by it. And then all of a sudden, it's gone. Do people hear Rusty snoring? I just realised he's right in front of the directional mic, our new posh mic that we that we have for this. Cool, and he's right in front of it, snoring. And I see it's quite loud for me. I have no idea if this is just making it even louder for everyone. But then you said you said, why is that? Why is it that when we're in it, it feels like there is that it's all that there is? Why is that? Why is it when we're in that experience, it feels like that's the only experience? that there is and the only thing that made sense at that time was is because we live in the moment we don't live in the future and we don't live in the past we live in the moment with whatever we are experiencing and so whatever we are experiencing that is all there is in that moment and it's like to be able to see that is to start to accept the down feelings it's to start to accept the feelings of anger that we sometimes fall into the feelings of self-righteousness it looks friggin real because it's all there is in the moment in the moment in the moment in the moment you know you could you could have lived another you could live you could i remember being in dubai and we're working with a lad out in dubai i mean of all the beautiful places to go and work um and we got taken to this amazing spot on the beach to work with this lad. And this lad wouldn't take a job. His mum and dad were like, he won't take a job, he won't work. So we got chatting to this lad and we're like, well, what is it? What is it do you think? Why won't you, why won't you do anything? Why do you want to go to work or go to college or anything like that? He said, he said, I don't want to get life wrong. I don't want to get it wrong. And this lad meant that. I don't want to make the wrong choice in life, so I'm not going to make any choice. This was driving his mum and dad mad. But this poor lad was terrified of making the wrong choice in life. So we took him up on the beach and we drew two lines in the sand. And we said, we drew a, a line going across and say about a metre long and about a foot through it, maybe a slightly less than a foot through it, we drew a vertical line through it. And we said, that's you now in your lifetime. This is your life. And here you are now. That's you. This is your life. One line. One line. How could you ever know if you were ever to get your life wrong? How can you get life wrong? How could you decide you got life wrong? The only way you could do that is if you had another life to compare it to, which you don't. So 
who drew the second line underneath his first line. There isn't two lines in life. There is just a singular life in the moment now. The idea that we can get life wrong could only be if we could compare it to something else and go, well, that turned out better. Perhaps I'll go with that. But then we don't know the ramifications of that turning out better. Tell the, that thing in a second, the Chinese proverb. Then we don't know the, the ramifications of that thing that went right. In the same way as we don't know the ramifications of the things that we think are going wrong for us in our life, like me going to prison or something, a fail in my college course, going to prison within six months for violence and just generally being a complete dickhead. I had no idea that later on in life, going to prison was going to be one of the most valuable things that ever happened to me. And that I would be going into prisons to help prisoners and talk to prisoners. And I could sit there and go, I've been there. I know what it's like. You're scared. It's horrible. I know what it's like. I know what it's like to always be on guard and be afraid and not act like you're afraid. You've got to act hard, which in itself is like keeping the fear alive because now people are afraid of you. And when people are scared, they do stupid shit. So it's like this lad wouldn't do anything because he was so afraid of getting life wrong. Life is a singular event. Right and wrong are two. It's a duality. Again, it's a perspective. And we become so afraid of it. So afraid of feeling the wrong feeling, feeling doing the wrong thing. If we can start to understand what we're talking about here, we start to make wiser choices because we stop making so many choices with our head and we start to listen more with our heart. That's just metaphor. It's just words. We start to listen, as you did there, Paul, where you described, you know, there's part of me, my, this kind of angry side of my mind right now that's going, fucking sort them right out. I'm going to sort them out. And then there's this more logical side that's going, just keep your gob shut, Paul. Show a little bit of compassion here, mate. You know, be very compassionate here. You see, when you awoke, you became aware of that other side of your being. You'll never get rid of your ego entirely. It's not the game of life. You won't want to. It's fun. Having the contrast. It's part of the fun. Did you get that point? I was just going to say, Kelly had her hand up for a while, so I don't know if she still remembers what she wanted to say. She's taken it down again, but I, I noticed, so. Unmute, hang on. There you go. I just get a bit shy sometimes. I have what I want to Whatever. say. Whatever. I just like, I can't say it. <laughs> I was just say I just wanted to kind of, I got caught into one of those mind storms last night, like literally the moment I came off of this with you guys, I had a challenging incident with my eldest son who wanted to invite a lot of people around the house. And I said, I'm okay if you have this amount of people and, and you sit in the, in the kitchen and you have a chat and you can have music on and stuff like that. But, but he wanted to go up into his bedroom, which, I didn't want to happen and so I said no I don't want that that I've said you can have some friends around which you're not supposed to be having anyway and you can sit in the other room but of course he wants to go upstairs into his bedroom and smoke weed and so he's going to then be like stinking the whole house out with weed so it was like I think I could have ignored that situation and not got into that with him it was like as if I noticed the shark and then I reacted to noticing the shark. But then I got into this other thing. I was like, well, don't notice. If you don't notice the shark, you're not actually being in the reality of this situation. You're not able to say to someone, actually, this is my boundary and you're crossing over it. Um, in hindsight now, I wish I'd have just ignored the shark and just went with what he wanted to do. Because actually what happened was I got so caught up in this, well, that's not what I want you to do in my house. And then, that, and then I was crying, I cried all night last night. And then all again this morning, I was just so completely 
overwhelmed by the fact that I'd engaged like that. So I think the reality of wanting to engage to set a boundary to say that's not okay, then kind of went into another realm and I was just totally caught up in this person wanting to do something that I didn't want them to do. And I knew in order for this to stop, I was gonna have to just let it all just happen. And uh, yeah, and that's kind of, a, you know, the, the line between, are you avoiding difficult situations or are you, by addressing the difficult situations, are you engaging in the reality of that situation? I, I just, not, never sometimes when I, you know, other times don't think about that kind of stuff at all. But when I'm faced in that kind of like, that spectacle of that moment that I wasn't expecting to happen, just like literally the second I came off, I was, I could have just asked for a little bit of time to think about it and think about, I don't know, I just got so, caught up in it and then I was so upset with myself for getting caught up with it. It was like I stabbed myself the second time. So I was so upset with getting caught. And then that kind of lasted until this morning, you know, I've just been feeling really tearful and upset that the other children have to kind of witness this kind of like battle, you know, it, oh, I just felt really bad. But again, you know, I had a reaction to a situation that upsets me. And maybe I could try to be a bit more neutral with myself because I've ended up beating myself up over the fact that I reacted to something. Why? Yeah. And that was what prolonged it. No, but the why? Did, I, I'd like you to have a think about it. why. Why did you, why are you beating yourself up by the way you reacted? Why? Is there a, what's the belief that is holding you prisoner right there? What's the belief that you think you should be better. Sorry. I was just going to say, I've just realised the time. Uh, I think Bill will be on at four, so I want people to have a little break beforehand. Okay. Um, but I'd love to hear actually how you see it tomorrow morning okay, uh, yeah, when we come yeah. back, if you're joining us tomorrow. I am. And the thing yeah. is, I'm just trying to say that I actually feel quite differently about it now. Yeah. Cool. Just, you know, like I can stay in there, but I stay in those frame, those places for a lot less time, but I still hate the fact that I do it. I need there's some level of acceptance, you know, that I got so caught up like that. You are allowed to be assertive. Mm. It's your house. They're your kids. You are a parent. Yeah. Kids are looking to people for kids are looking to parents for guidance. You are allowed to say no. This isn't about being passive. In fact, I really want to make this this really clear. If people sorry, if people do yeah. want to have a quick break, go now. Um yeah. And we'll back be back at, at four because I think Bill will be on, on time. I just want to make this really clear. The principles are not passive. They're not about how to be. They're how you are. What you are. They're not about always being this beautiful space. They're about you live in the world of your own mind, your own experience, go live. Sometimes in this earthbound existence, you're gonna to have to have challenging conversations with your children. Sometimes in this earthbound experiences, we're gonna to have to have challenging conversations with work colleagues. It's part of life. They're not, telling, they're not telling anybody how to live. And if in that moment you were like, absolutely not, no, I don't want you smoking weed in my house. You can stay there. That's the best I'm gonna give you. That's fair enough. There's nothing wrong. It's not nothing. I don't personally, I mean, this is my, I don't see anything wrong with that. I think he should be considering himself lucky that he's got a mother that would even give, give him friends access during these times. Many parents wouldn't, you know, it depends on how you look at it. The thing is, I don't feel like I have any, you know, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter how I approach it. I'm just being followed around and battered by this person who just won't let me kind of like have my own, Space, I don't know how to sort of... It sounds to me more like it, Kel. You follow yourself around and batter yourself. Mm. I think that's what I'm hearing more. Mm. Is that you're following yourself around and you're judging yourself on the way that you spoke and what you decided and what you chose in that moment. Given the information you had in that moment, that was the decision you made. Again, we're coming back to this moment thing. Mm. Time's a beautiful thing hindsight's amazing we can really learn from hindsight but it's based in time now there is no time there is just the moment mm. 
So the decisions that we make in the moment are the own, are made from the information that we have in the moment, given what we have, we see the world in that very present moment. And it cannot be anything other than that. There is just one time now, no duality now. And many people say this, I wish I'd done different. You couldn't, nobody could do, nobody could do anything different in their lifetime. They couldn't have done. It's impossible. Given what, thought occurred in that moment was what we acted upon and how we felt given the state of consciousness in that moment is what we acted on and how we felt there is no there is no other in that mm. there is no other to act upon there is just what is in the moment 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 mm. so that whole i wish i had done well that's great you can think that but you're beating the shit out of yourself and you're driving yourself mad on an impossibility something that was ultimately totally impossible it's not possible for you to have done anything different. It isn't. I, the, the, the fact is that is how I feel about it. I didn't want loads of friends around here going up in this room smoking me. That that's the fact. But I wasn't able to. I'm, I'm not even against smoking weed. He can smoke as much weed as he wants. It's the fact that he smoked so much strong weed in my house, and my whole house stinks. And it's like, I, go outside and do it. I'm being more than reasonable. Just go outside in the garden and do it. Stop Sorry. doing it in my house. Stop doing it over and over and over and over again. It's like I haven't got any real... I don't know how to put myself across to actually get what I want as opposed to just getting into that embroiled argument about, you know... Just, you know, after an event like that, just the end of my energy is just completely zapped. You know, this morning, I was just like, oh, but, you know, I've got my camera on now. So I'm, I'm like, Paul, I'm, I'm coming back in. <laughs> nice to know, isn't it? It's nice to know. Mm. One yeah, of the I, I, know that. I really what? want people to yeah. have a little bit of space before Bill comes on. because It's an hour and a half. Okay. So you've got eight minutes before Bill joins and we'll, we'll definitely come back to this tomorrow yeah just, I'm going to just, stop the recording. just yeah still recording them but one of the things 